Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Good Friday service here at Bellevue. I uh, just want to welcome you. Thank you so much for being here and being a part of this service. Uh, just to give you a few moments of, of kind of what to expect. This is going to be a, a very uh, casual, intimate type service tonight. Uh, going to be a lot of scripture reading, a lot of music, and then uh, some video in there as well. And so I just want to, again, welcome you. Thank you for taking time out of your evening to be here. And uh, I hope that you will just be able to worship tonight, hear the words that we're reading, the scripture, as we look at this story together. And then and also, uh, let's just worship him for what he has done. Because it is truly a good Friday. And every day is good when we recognize the sacrifice that he has made for us. So let's worship him tonight. And we'll do that. I'll begin by opening us in a word of prayer. And then we'll have our first reading. Let's go in prayer. Father God, we come before you tonight. And Lord, we come once again thanking you for your grace and your mercy. Father, we come praising you for your goodness and who you are. And so, Lord, tonight as we come into this place and we celebrate the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for us, Lord, we can't help but be overwhelmed. And, Father, I pray that tonight in this place as we worship you, that, Lord, you would remove any distractions that would seek to keep us from focusing solely upon you and your word and worshiping you tonight. Father, we pray that in this place your name would be glorified in all that we do and all that we say. And, Lord, we just ask that you would bless our service tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first reading tonight is from Matthew 26, verses 6 through the end of the chapter. In verse 6 it says, Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask of very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. But Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. In pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, who had betrayed him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of this vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom.
Our next reading tonight comes from Mark 14, and we'll be looking at verses 32 through 42. And see here the prayer of Jesus in Gethsemane. And they went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to answer him. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand.
Our next reading tonight will be from Psalm 31, and we will look at verses 1 through 17. Verse 1, it says to the choir master, a psalm of David. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me speedily. Be a rock of refuge for me, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. You take me out of the net that they have hidden for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord. Faithful God, I hate those who pay regard to worthless idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction. You have known the distress of my soul and you have not delivered me into the hand of the enemy. You've set my feet in a broad place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Because of all my adversaries, I have become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. For I hear the whispering of many terror on every side as they scheme together against me, as they plot to take my life. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. O Lord, let me not be put to shame, for I call upon you.
Our reading now will be from Mark 14, 55 through 59, and Mark 15, 1 through 5. Verse 55, it says, Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this testimony did not agree. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things, and Pilate again asked him, Have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. cross. So in this moment, Pilate thinks, I hold the destinies of these two men in my hand. I know the Jews have a tradition that on a holy day, I will release one of the prisoners on death row. Pilate stands on this audacious stage who now presents Jesus, son of the living God, versus Barabbas, the thug and rebel. He says, all right, who do you want? This is blasphemy. This is this has gone too far. There's no comparison. This is a rightful prisoner, a man who should be on death row. He's a rebel against Rome. He leads a, a rebellion. He murders people. He's a bad man. He's a thug and he's a crook. He deserves the chains and he deserves the crucifixion. Jesus, what has he done but heal, restore? deliver, set free, open blind eyes, open deaf ears, heal the lame and the leper. What, what has Jesus done? Who do you want? We, we want Barabbas. Yeah, give us Barabbas. They give us Barabbas. The Roman soldiers come up and they put the key in and they unlock Barabbas from his chains and shackles. And he walks down the platform, welcomed by all of his thug friends. Yeah, the people love me. Yeah, that's right. I don't even know who this Jesus guy is, but all I know is my people love me. There seems to be no conscience in Barabbas. There's no record of him turning to Jesus and saying, I owe you everything now, or you have set me free. No, I don't see any of that in Barabbas. God knew that. Jesus stood there, silent for he knew the will of the Father. He said, it's fine, Father. Let him have Barabbas. For Jesus knew that the Father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Barabbas thought it was the people that set him free. No, 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 no. It was the love of the Heavenly Father.
He probably would have never acknowledged the free gift. Yeah, but I love perhaps. For while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son for Barabbas, even the one he knew would walk away from Jesus and his free gift and never come back. He loves them. And the nerve, the call, the audacity of believers to think, I got saved by grace, but now that I'm in this deep, dark place of bondage, I better work hard to get myself out. What? That's the opposite of the gospel. Are you bound? Are you held under the power of this temptation, this sin, the sexual urges? Do you feel like it's controlling you? What are you gonna do? I'm gonna shake myself free. Stop it! No, you won't. You're no match for the powers of hell and the urges of sin and sexual temptation. You will not overcome it and you will never overcome it. You'll just be another statistic. There's no answer within yourself. Your own marriage, your own goodness, your own discipline, your own devotion will not save your marriage and will not save your kids. There's only one. And he's the one that took your place. He's the one that stood silently on the platform with Pilate and said, yes, let him have Barabbas. Take me. How many times have I stood on that platform with Pilate and Jesus and I'm the Barabbas and they start to take my chains off and I say, no, no, I deserve this. I deserve the guilt. I deserve the shame. I deserve the consequence. I deserve it. Jesus seems to look at me and say, no, son, let me have it. Let me have your sin, let me have your pain. No, God, I did it to myself. I deserve it. My marriage won't make it. This is what I deserve. I deserve divorce. I deserve poverty. I deserve sickness. I deserve it all. No! God, I, I'm so ashamed. Give me your shame. But God, what if I do it again? I'll still be here. Oh God, I don't want to hurt you. I love you. I, I don't want to do this anymore. Give me your sins, son. This is all we got. It's all I got, it's all you got. We can play games, we can play church games. We can pretend like some people are better than others and that's why they're blessed, or we can all come to the honest conclusion that it's God and it's God alone. The greatest challenge is not your discipline, your devotion, your focus. Your greatest challenge is believing the gospel. Could it be that there's a God with a love so scandalous, so wide, so deep, so vast, so high, so expansive, so welcoming, so inclusive. Let me have your sin, son. Okay. When I give him my sin, when I stand in this empty space of forgiveness and acceptance while Jesus walks off to the cross that I deserve. I see him, I see him walking to the post to be whipped. As I stand a free man, all the attention is turned now. And I feel the love of God saying, go son, live your life. I'll pay the price. Where did we get off thinking that we were gonna set ourselves free? It's still Jesus. It'll always be Jesus. It'll never stop being the power of Jesus. If his blood is sufficient for your salvation, his blood is sufficient to sustain you through every challenge and every sin and every temptation. Jesus is enough.
Our next reading tonight is from Isaiah 53. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the, out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He was put to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand, and out of the anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of the many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53 to me has always been one of the hardest passages in Scripture to read over because it says that it pleased God to do this. We say, how in the world can that be? It did because that was what it took to save us. That was the, the, the extent of the separation between His holiness and our fallenness. And so as we think about that tonight, as we think about Jesus recognizing that He bore our sins, our sorrow, our punishment, all that stuff. And we somehow come out of that with righteousness. What an amazing truth that we can celebrate tonight. And I hope that that will be something that we reflect on and think about as we approach Sunday.
Our next reading tonight is from Matthew 27, verses 31 through 37. Verse 31, it says, And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and they compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. We know from John 19.30 where it says, Jesus cried out, It is finished. We recognize that he truly is the King of the Jews. He truly is our King. And in that moment when he said it is finished, we recognize he was bearing the punishment for our sins. And that statement should give us comfort because we recognize that it is over. The sins are behind. They are removed as far as the east is from the west. And because of his work on the cross, because of him bearing that punishment, we now get to experience the love of God. We get to experience what it means to be his children And so we can rejoice in that tonight.
Our final reading tonight is Luke 23, verses 44 through 46. It says, It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, when the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Every one of the Gospels records Jesus' uh, death in non-standard language. They don't talk about it as any other death ever would be, and we recognize it's because it was quite unlike any other death. Number one, it was very short term. But number two, we recognize it was because even there, Jesus was in control. He stopped breathing. He gave up his spirit. He was in charge, and he is the victor over death. And we can celebrate that. That's why we can look at verses like 1 Corinthians where it talks about death being swallowed up in victory. Because Christ is king over all, including death. And so when we put our hope and our faith and our trust in him, we recognize that we too will rise from the grave. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you tonight in awe of who you are. Lord, we come before you tonight praising you, shouting hallelujah, because Lord, we recognize the weight of what happened. Father, we recognize the sacrifice that Christ made. We recognize your holiness and our sinfulness. And Lord, we see that we need him. Lord, your word tells us there is no other way by which we are reconciled to you. But there's one mediator. That is your son, Jesus. So, Father, tonight my prayer, my hope is that, Lord, you would call out tonight. You would speak to us. Lord, the lost would be saved. They would put that hope and faith and trust in you. And, Father, for those of us who are saved, for those who follow you, that, Lord, we would not take this lightly. But we would live our life mindful of the sacrifice that Christ made, knowing that we are not our own, but we were bought with a price. In Christ's name, amen. As we close tonight, I just want to tell you one final thing. The very next verse there talks about a centurion. And in the Gospels, it talks about him having said, after he saw all the things that happened, he said, surely this was the Son of God. When we're confronted with the truth and the power of Jesus, we have no choice but to say, surely, definitely, certainly, this is Jesus. May that be our response tonight. Now we're going to close again, in a, just like we did on Sunday, we're going to close with the acapella of doxology. And this time I would love it if we could just all sing together so that I'm not on my own. We have the words on the screen for you. But guys, our theology is doxology. What we believe about Jesus makes us want to worship. And so let's praise him together tonight one last time and we'll be dismissed. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.